Hey guys, so um, we have two lectures to do for Tuesday, um, and one is chapter 45, the other is chapter 46, and since we've decided to do lecture maps together in class, they take a little bit longer to get through than the PowerPoints, um, but I do think that they are more effective in helping you to get down the key points of the lectures. Uh, so, in an effort to help us uh, stay on track and get through all of the stuff, that we need to get through uh, in a timely fashion. I made a lecture map for chapter 45, so you can go through and create your own lecture map from this one to use uh, for your notes that you're allowed to use uh, for your exam. Um, you cannot print this one and use it for your exam, so don't try. But you can create one uh, similar to or uh, from this one, or you can go through the chapter and read it, or through the PowerPoint and um, create one for yourself. So, uh, chapter 45 covers orientation to the lab. We will map out chapter 46 in class together, so don't worry about that one for now. This one is just covering um, only chapter 45. So we start with uh, here uh, types of labs, and we're going to go this way and kind of down and around and back up to the record keeping is where we're going to uh, finish off. So let me zoom in here. We have a couple of different types of labs that um, we work with in as medical assistants sometimes. One of those is a physician's office lab. That's a place that you will most often find medical assistants. Those labs are located within practices uh, and they are used usually to provide a more accurate and timely processing of routine tests and that allows us to get the reporting of results to physicians faster. So the way that the POLs work is um, most of the time it is typically just a draw site. Sometimes there's a fully functioning um, lab inside the office and uh, other times it's just a draw station and that will be in there where labs will be drawn at the office and then sent out to what the other type of lab is, which is a reference lab. And so that is sometimes known as a send out lab. And that is owned and operated by an organization that is outside of the practice. Now, um, if a reference lab has a phlebotomist that is inside of the physician's office lab, then that phlebotomist will usually work for the reference lab. So for example, if Quest Diagnostics has a phlebotomist that is stationed inside my physician's office um, practice, then that phlebotomist probably works for, or medical assistant probably works for Quest, um, and is just contracted to work within my practice, the physician's office practice that I uh, go to. But if it's a physician's office lab, then it is owned by the practice and they are an employee of the practice and uh, the tests are sometimes ran there at the office and within the practice. And so those results can then be um, provided to the physician from within the lab at the practice. Now if it is anything that is uh, of moderate complexity or high complexity, which we'll get to in just a few minutes, then those have to be sent out to a reference lab because most of those POL labs do not have um, uh, the CLIA certifications to run higher or um, moderate complexity tests. Some do if they go through the proficiency uh, requirements and other things to get them, but most of the time um, those are reserved for really big multi-physician, multi-specialty practices, so those are kind of hard to come by. So those are the two types of labs, the POL is the physician's office lab, and then the reference labs are the send-out labs. We look at lab departments, let me move over here. Uh, when we look at lab departments, and what they do. We have cytology, which uh, tests cells under the microscope and looks for different disease patterns and um, other ways that cells um, are sick. So looks for cancers, looks for misshapen cells, looks for any deformities, looks for anything, um, genetic anomalies, anything that could be wrong. And cells cytology is the department 
that will look for those. We have immunology, which tests for autoimmune disease, so things like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and other things, uh, diseases that attack your own body or attack your own immune system. Um, those are tested in immunology. We have blood bank. Yeah, uh, that's supposed to be a little red blood cell there. It's not great, but it's there. Uh, we have a blood bank, and that department stores blood and blood products for transfusions. We have urinalysis, which, given the name, is pretty easy to figure out, tests urine for diseases and disorders. We have serology, which tests the liquid portion of blood for antibodies, um, and so antibodies are involved in our immune response. We then have histology, which looks at tissues underneath a microscope for diag uh, diagnosing various diseases and disorders of uh, tissue, or for looks at the various disease processes in a tissue. We have hematology, which tests blood to identify the count and size of cells. There's a number of different um, uh, markers for cells, uh, there's microcytic, macrocytic, uh, which are cells, sizes and shapes, and there's a, a bunch of different things that, um, ways that we measure uh, cell size and shape, and hematology does all of those. There's microbiology, which tests for pathogenic microorganisms, that's my little pathogen guy right there, he's kind of cute. And then lastly, we have toxicology, which identifies all of the poisons and chemicals. Uh, and so anytime that we have to have a lead test done or um, any, like if, we, if there's a suspected poisoning or an unknown uh, chemical that is in the blood or on the skin or anywhere in the body, then uh, toxicology is what will test that. Toxicology, coincidentally, is also the department that um, will do all of the drug screens and all of the alcohol screens for uh, any reason as well. So if you want to know what your role as a medical assistant may be in the lab, uh, it's mostly to prepare the patient for uh, specimen collection and then to collect the sample depending on what it is. Most of the time we collect blood, sputum. Um, we will take collected semen uh, specimens, and so we, we clearly don't collect those for uh, the gentleman, but we do handle the collected semen uh, specimens for semen analysis. We also collect, uh, I said blood, sputum, urine is a big one, stool specimens, so fecal specimens, and uh, semen for semen analysis, uh, cultures for wound cultures, throat cultures, uh, saliva, and uh, a bunch of other things. So we handle a lot of different types of specimens, but collecting them is mostly just blood, saliva, sputum, fecal, and then the transport of uh, semen. You um, can also complete some of the testing if it is some of the CLIA wave stuff, so strep testing, urine pregnancy, um, some of the uh, photometer testing, um, like glucometer, uh, excuse me, the, like the uh, glucose testing on the um, glucometers or uh, cholesterol testing on the little handheld cholesterol machines or anything like that. Sometimes we complete the actual testing itself and we then report out the results when we're done with completing the testing. The other roles that you have include knowing any OSHA regulations and CLIA regulations and making sure that you are following those at all times and making sure that you are completing any quality controls to ensure quality assurance. Um, we'll get to that uh, down here. You have a duty to prevent accidents by maintaining a safe work environment. And one of the ways that we do that is to make sure that we are uh, always um, carefully disposing of any biohazardous waste and keeping up with our housekeeping duties. So um, the uh, 
roles that we play in a lab, I worked in a lab for a really long time. I was a phlebotomist for a long time. I've worked in both a reference lab and a POL lab. And actually, to be honest with you, it was one of my very favorite jobs. Um, I learned a ton while working in the lab. And so um, you kind of become a, a bit of a jack of all trades when you work in a lab. And it's a lot of medical assistants, I don't think, end up working in labs because they don't know that that's a path that they can kind of forge in their career. Um, but if you have an opportunity to do it, even if you only do it for a year, I encourage you to do it because you, you definitely learn quite a bit uh, while you're working in a lab. All right, so uh, down to lab safety. These are things that you have to do. So you have to, in order to maintain lab safety, let me blow this up for you a little bit, maybe move it over here, there you go. Uh, things that you have to do. You have to wear gloves when you're touching bodily fluids. Not only do you have to, you should just want to because it's gross if you don't. Um, aside from it just being plain gross, it's dangerous if you don't because you should consider all specimens to be contaminated, which is number 11 down here. Um, you always also have to change your gloves between patients. Before you put new gloves on, you should wash your hands. So you wear gloves. When you're done with your patient, you take them off, wash your hands, and then change into new gloves, put new gloves on. You need to wear goggles and masks when appropriate. So if there's ever a chance of air droplets or spray or anything, um, you want to make sure you've got goggles and masks on if you need those. You should avoid injury from sharp and or pointed objects. I know that sounds basic, but it's worth reiterating here that you are touching needles and sometimes scalpels and other things. And so you want to make sure that you're extra careful not to poke yourself with a, a dirty needle um, or even a clean needle because, you know, you don't want to, to hurt yourself, but especially uh, a dirty needle. Also, avoid injury from broken glass and hopefully there's never broken glass if you're careful and following your safety precautions. Um, but you want to make sure that you don't pick up any broken glass in the lab with your bare hands or anything like that. You want to always use standard precautions and actually I'm going to upload a, a standard precautions form and canvas for you to sign uh, in a couple in this week probably over the weekend. Uh, so you'll learn all about those. But your standard precautions basically mean that you assume that everything uh, is contaminated and you wear your personal protective equipment to protect both you and your patient from any transmission of any potentially harmful uh, pathogens or disease. You uh, only use recommended equipment and, and instruments. So listen. The first thing I thought of when I was writing this out last night was I use butter knives as screwdrivers sometimes. That's the truth. I don't know if anybody else does that, but I do stupid things like that pretty frequently. I use butter knives as screwdrivers. I use screwdrivers sometimes as box openers. And, you know, I mean, people use things that they are not intended for as other things all the time. I cannot be the only one on the planet who uses things for things that they are not intended for. The lab is not one of those places where you want to use things that they are not intended for. I say that and just in my mind it popped up, I just recalled in my mind where um, I'm pretty sure a couple of you saw me the other day opening a box in the lab with a scalpel. So if you saw that, I'm really sorry, don't judge me for that. Uh, in the lab, though, you don't want to use needles for anything other than what they're intended for. You don't want to use the instruments or the equipment for anything other than what they're intended for. Um, it can be dangerous. You can hurt yourself. Or you could damage really expensive equipment. Uh, number seven, you want to be careful not to spill specimens during transport, especially urine and semen. Urine uh, can be messy to clean up. I've spilt urine analysis cups, like cups of urine, it's not fun. And it also is gross. It smells sometimes, it's just not fun, especially when it's on you. And semen, also not fun. Just throwing that out there. Uh, sputum, sputum is another one that's not fun when you are uh, transporting it and it spills. 
so just be mindful of that. Number eight, contaminated uh, work, that should say work, not word, work surfaces have to be disinfected with a 10% bleach solution. So that means one part bleach to 10 parts of water in a gallon. So one, one part bleach uh, to 10 parts water per gallon, and you want to make sure, usually we mix it up in a gallon, you can mix it up in less, but it's still 10%. 1 to 10 ratio there. And so uh, all contaminated work surfaces need to be disinfected with that solution. Number nine, you want to make sure we are uh, disposing biohazardous waste carefully and correctly. So only things that need to go into the biohazardous waste go into the biohazard containers. Sharps go into sharps containers and things that are saturated, saturated with bodily uh, materials or things that have um, been exposed to uh, bodily fluids need to go into those large biohazardous trash cans. Number 10, never wear your PPE outside of the lab. There was a, a rule in every lab that I worked in, you never wore your lab coat outside of the lab because you could be carrying pathogens or other icky things from inside the lab to the outside world and contaminate people outside or other surfaces outside and you just don't want to do that. So you don't want to wear anything that you've been wearing inside the lab to the outside. Uh, we just hang them up and leave them in there and then put them back on when we come back in. Every specimen is treated as if it's contaminated, so that's a good rule of thumb to live by. Number 12, do not put things in your mouth in the lab or store food in the lab refrigerators. I kid you not, I worked at a hospital in Indiana and uh, one time, and I worked in the lab in the hospital, and one time I walked past and um, I, worked, I worked second shift, and so it got busy because that was in the evening, and so during the summer we had a lot of motor vehicle accidents in the emergency room and so the lab was really busy blood bank was really busy and uh, we had, were doing a lot of lab draws up in the ER it was just really really busy it seemed like on second shift right and so I am not even kidding one night I walked over my job I had to go take a, a specimen to uh, from the one of the coolers over to the histology department which happened to be up on a different floor and so the lab I worked in was in the basement and so I had to go take it up right well they take me they send me over to the cooler to get it it's this large garbage can the specimen is a garbage can and uh, right above it on a shelf uh, this garbage can was at the bottom of this cooler and there was a shelf directly above it and there was somebody's lunch bag sitting in there and so I asked uh, whose lunch bag that was and they told me and uh, the lady, the lady I worked with, she came and got her lunch bag and the uh, specimen that I rolled out of there in a garbage can happened to have been, I later found out, an amputated leg uh, that was taken off earlier that day in surgery because it was uh, full of gangrene. So uh, <laughs> that lady her lunch had been hanging out in a cooler for a couple of hours because she didn't have time. She was, it was because she had been really busy and she got slammed the minute she clocked in and uh, she hadn't had time to take it all the way back to the break room yet and so she just threw it in there uh, with a gangrene leg all day long. Uh, she did not eat it, in case you were wondering, she did not eat it. But, uh, you know, you don't want to put things in your mouth that have been stored in lab refrigerators because there are gross things in lab refrigerators. So, mm, that's gross. Also, there's a rule not to apply cosmetics like lipstick or makeup or eye makeup or anything inside of a lab because things are floating around in the air that could contaminate you uh, anytime you put them anywhere near a mucous membrane. For number 13, you want to learn the OSHA regulations and your facility's policy for cleaning up blood or blood products. And make sure you know where to find the written policies. And then lastly, for number 14, uh, housekeeping duties reduce the risk of serious contamination in the lab. So you don't want to skip out on those because they help keep everybody safe and hopefully not sick. All right, so um, quality assurance. Okay, let me move this up so it's a little bigger. Move it over here. Sorry about all the moving around. Do what we can. Okay, so with quality assurance, uh, there's this thing called CLIA. And CLIA stands for the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. 
and those were put out in 1988. Now, if you look in your book, it'll probably tell you that they were actually put out someplace originally in the 1960s, maybe 65, 67, something like that, uh, but they were amended in 1988. So the most recent version of these, uh, of this Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act was in 1988, and so that's the standard that we abide by now for laboratory testing. And these amendments came to because in the early 80s, there were a whole lot of women who were having pap smears done. And as you may or may not know, when you have a pap smear done, cells are taken from the cervix and they are sent off to a lab to be uh, examined for potential cervical cancer. And so uh, in the early 80s, there wasn't a whole lot of quality assurance controls in place for the laboratories who were performing the tests on those cervical cell samples. And so, um, a lot of the uh, malignant cells that were being sent off to, t to the lab, so a lot of the cells that actually had cancer, were being falsely reported out as uh, negative. So being falsely reported out as benign uh, results s stating that they did not have cancer. And then women were going a whole year after having those results done before they got another pap smear done and, uh, and, and then being diagnosed, or sometimes even two or three years, and so, um, or until they had symptoms and had to have another exam. And so women were essentially dying because of these faulty quality assurance measures um, or a lack of quality assurance measures in laboratories, which allowed all of these thousands of uh, inaccurate test results to be reported out for these women who had cervical cancer. And so because of that, uh, the CDC um, called upon uh, the government to amend the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act and put forth stricter reg regulations for any laboratory test, uh, facility who tests any human samples. And so there are three levels of CLIA testing, and uh, all facilities that conduct tests for diagnosing, preventing, or treating human diseases, or assessing any human health conditions that fall underneath the CDC regulations have to man, uh, maintain these CLIA mandates. So they all fall under CLIA mandates and regulations. So the three levels are the Certificate of Waiver. This is where most of those PLL labs will fall under. Um, so most of the time, the, the actually all of the time, the labs that you as a medical assistant will perform will be CLIA wa waived labs. So those are the only type of labs that you as a medical assistant um, have the education level to perform are labs that fall under the Certificate of Waiver, which are more commonly known as CLIA waived labs. So those are tests that are performed on some tests, not all, but some tests that are performed on urine, blood, fecal, saliva, nasal smears, vaginal smears, uh, throat swabs, and semen tests. And then there's the moderate complexity level, and those tests all must be done by a pathologist who has either an MD, so a medical doctor, license, or a PhD. And then there's the high complexity level, and those tests are subject to inspection and proficiency testing. And also they have to be uh, participating in a quality assurance program, which is headed by a MD or a scientist with a PhD. So for the moderate complexity and high complexity tests, all of them, both moderate and high, have to complete in that proficiency testing, and they have to adhere to a standard operating procedure um, that is set forth by CLIA and the CDC. And if they fail that, uh, any of those components of the standard operating procedure, then they won't be allowed to do the test that they failed um, anymore and potentially any other tests as well. So say they are doing um, pathology exams on those cervical uh, cell samples from pap smears and they fail the, the a component of the standard operating procedure or a proficiency testing on that, then that lab would not be allowed to complete uh, cervical pathology testing from pap smears any longer, and then they stand to also lose the ability to complete any other tests as well. 
so the second part of quality assurance is quality control. Um, and that focuses mostly on accurate test results for our purposes. So this is the part, uh, quality control is the part that we as the MAs do the most or have the most involvement in. One of the things that we do is calibration, and that is where we use uh, what we call a standard specimen to ensure that equipment is producing uh, accurate results. And so what we have is basically a known sample. Um, for example, if we have, if we are calibrating a glucometer, then we will put a test strip in there with a standard specimen. It comes with the glucometer test strip bottle, and it's uh, a chip or, or a test strip in there. And we already know that the result of that strip is going to be like 88 or 104 or whatever it is for that strip. That's our standard specimen. It's our known result. Um, and so we can put that in there and it helps calibrate the machine to that uh, standard so that we make sure that the machine is working correctly. Another way that we perform quality control is by using controls. And those are a lot like standard specimens, um, except for we uh, use those before each patient sample. So with the standard specimens and calibration, we only calibrate the machine once a day uh, when we uh, are going to use them. And with controls, we put the controls in before each patient. So controls have uh, positive and negatives usually, and they're used on a test that's going to show a qualitative response. So qualitative is going to give you a positive or a negative response. And so the most commonly um, used example for a qualitative uh, uh, test is a urine pregnancy test. And so if you think of your common over-the-counter from Walgreens urine pregnancy test, you would um, get a positive or a negative result. So one line you're pregnant, no, it was I think two lines you're pregnant, one line you're not. That is a qualitative response. And so you get either a positive, yes, you are pregnant, or a negative, mm, you're not pregnant result. A quantitative test is used to tell you the amount of substance in a specimen. So typically, after a patient uh, takes that qualitative urine pregnancy test at home, and they're like, man, I got two lines, I need to go see the doctor and confirm, then they will go to the doctor and the doctor will order a quantitative HCG level blood test. And so then the patient will go to the lab and the lab will draw a tube of blood and they will run a quantitative level on the HCG hormone in the blood specimen. And so that quantitative level, quantitative levels for any specimen will give you a number. It produces um, uh, something that is quantifiable. And so it's not just a negative or a positive, it gives you an actual reading or a number of uh, uh, the amount of something that is in something else. And then lastly, uh, we also sometimes use reagents, and those are uh, testing chemicals that also need calibration with a control from time to time. And so uh, there are various testing um, procedures that we use, and sometimes some of the equipment that we use uses reagents as well. And so we sometimes have to test the reagents with controls to calibrate them and make sure that the reagents are working appropriately. All right, so let me zoom this back out here. So when we look at equipment in the lab, uh, one of these things you already know about because we've been working with it uh, for the last week or so, and that's our autoclave. The autoclave is used to sterilize and eradicate any microorganisms. And we use the autoclave before instruments are used on a patient to make sure that they are clean and sterile before they uh, can introduce any microorganisms to a patient during a procedure. Another one is a photometer, and it's an electronic device. It's usually pretty small. Some of them are actually really big, um, but the ones that we use are pretty small, most of the time handheld. And it is a device that measures light intensity. One example that you will see in our lab is are the handheld glucometers that uh, measure the reflected light 
in blood sugar. And so they are also, even though they're glucometers measuring the blood sugar levels, they are also there by photometers because they are measuring uh, reflective light in the blood. Centrifuges are uh, pieces of equipment that spin specimens at a high speed until it separates into its components. It's usually used in the POL to spin and separate whole blood, um, which is one of the things that you will use it for in the 219 class, or the phlebotomy class, uh, or the phlebotomy section of the class. And um, sometimes it's used to prep urine for examination as well. So sometimes we have to spin down um, urine to separate any floaters that may be in there or any sediment. And uh, so on occasion we have a reason to spin urine as well. The microscope, that is the uh, instrument that is most often used in the physician's office lab. The optical microscope is also known as the light microscope, and it's the one that you're going to see the most often in the POL. There is another kind of microscope called a compound microscope. Uh, it uses two light lenses or two lenses to magnify uh, the image, and uh, that's because two lenses are better than one. So, yeah, good news there. Microscopes must be kept clean. And also, they should always be kept covered. My, most microscopes come with a cover, and they you should keep the cover on them when you're storing them to make sure that you keep all skin, hair, dust, uh, eye makeup, oils, anything floating around in the air. Um, you know, you want to keep those things away from the microscope because they can contaminate the light source or the lenses and get trapped inside there and then things look funny when you're looking through the oculars and trying to visualize what is on the stage. So there's a picture of the microscope here for you and uh, most microscopes, our microscopes, have our binoculars which means that they have two eyepieces. The one in this example um, I specifically picked because ours are binocular um, to show you that some of them only have one eyepiece so this is a, a monocular um, microscope. Then you have the nose piece, which has the objectives in it. The objectives have those lenses in it uh, that magnify, uh, you know, 10, is 100 times, 10 times, 40 times, I think it is. You'll have to check uh, Mites' video on the microscope usage that's posted in the learning objectives page because she did a pretty cool video for you there. The stage is where we place the specimen slides, and it has these two metal clips to hold the specimen for viewing. There's a diaphragm and a light source underneath that you can use to um, control the amount of light that goes in up into the slide. And then the arm over here is what holds the oculars and the nose piece, and that is the only place it is ever acceptable to pick up a microscope. You don't ever want to pick it up from the ocular or from the nose piece or from the stage or from anywhere else. You want to pick it up with the arm and at the base. Your other hand supports the base of the microscope. Microscopes are usually pretty costly, and so uh, you don't want to pick those up from some place where it might come off and you drop it. The last uh, type of equipment that we use frequently in the lab is uh, various types of measuring equipment. So we have pipettes, and I don't know if you've seen those yet over in our lab room, but they are these little plastic guys and they have a bulb on the end. They're uh, used to suck up liquid into them to transfer usually from one container to another or to suck liquid off to dispose um, and into uh, trash or into the sink. We also use flasks and beakers, not so much for our program, but in many labs there are flasks and beakers to measure liquid volumes. A hemocytometer is a counting chamber device for counting blood cells, and oddly enough it looks very much like the grid paper on which this lecture map is done, um, but it's a way for uh, lab techs to count the number of blood cells that they see within a square inch on a slide. And so this uh, a grid very much like this one will be printed on a slide or laid on top of a slide or underneath a slide and then they can uh, 
use that hemocytometer um, to count out the number of white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, anything like that. And then thermometers, hopefully you know what the thermometer is by now, but if not, it's used to measure temperature. Uh, most thermometers in the lab in the U.S. are used in Fahrenheit, uh, occasionally in Celsius, rarely in Kelvin. Sorry, my dog barked. Um, okay, so when we look at uh, patient communication, this is the box outlined up here in the purple. Let me make it bigger for you. The last two sections we have are patient communication and then record keeping up here at the top. Patient communication, ways that you may communicate with the patient before the test include any diet restrictions they may have. Do they need to be fasting for 12 hours? That's pretty common with a lot of our labs um, for cholesterol testing, glucose testing, anything like that. Most of the time the doctor will want to make sure that they have an accurate reading and so uh, in order to get that the patient needs to not have anything to eat or drink for 12 hours. That usually includes uh, everything except for small amounts of water. So any diet restrictions uh, need to be communicated to a patient. Also, sometimes medication restrictions. Sometimes we draw labs that have peak and trough levels. And so if we, for example, vancomycin often has a peak and trough level. And so if there are any medication adjustments that need to be made or restrictions uh, where the patient should withhold their medication, then we need to relay those to the patient prior to the test. We also need to make sure that the patient has a valid ID so that we can uh, verify and make sure that we are, in fact, drawing the correct patient. In addition to verifying their um, identity with their valid ID, you will also uh, make sure that you uh, do the, your two identifiers when you are pulling the patient back to the room by uh, asking the patient to state their last name and their date of birth to you, not you telling them is your last name Lee and your date of birth whatever, whatever, whatever. You want to make sure that you ask the patient to tell you what that information is um, and that helps one, ensure privacy and two, also um, make sure that the patient is the correct one and that they aren't just agreeing with whatever you're saying because they aren't paying attention to you. You want to make sure you mind your nonverbal communication too. Sometimes a lot of your um, communication comes through uh, in the way that you are postured or in the way that you're moving your hands or the way that your face looks. I have to mind that a lot. Um, it's something I work on pretty frequently. Sometimes my face says things that my mouth doesn't, um, even when I don't really mean to. Um, and so you, if you are one of those people that has um, a face <laughs> that sometimes people uh, assume is not very friendly, then you should work on that as well and make sure you are smiling and make, putting your patients at ease even before the test. A lot of patients get freaked out about lab draws. Um, even though it's a pretty quick and easy procedure, if people have needle phobias, then they it's not a quick and easy procedure for them. It's something that they have have built up in their mind. And, you know, uh, having somebody who is cranky or has body uh, uh, not bad nonverbal communication is not going to help that any. During the collection, you want to make sure that you uh, stay cool and balance your friendly and uh, professional um, vibes there. Make sure that you're not, um, you know, too overly friendly, but also not super strict and professional. And make sure that. Uh, you are always respectful to your patients and that you are diligent about maintaining their privacy. Your patient is going to be your only focus while you are actually collecting the specimen. And I'm 
drawing blood is what's coming to mind here while uh, going over this section. So specifically, especially if you're drawing labs, you want to make sure that you are watching the patient to make sure that they're not, you know, showing signs of fainting, or um, if they're you know, panicking, you want to make sure that you are focused on the patient and talking them through it. Um, one thing I do want to note here is that during collection, you do not want to ever tell a patient anything that is not true. So if they ask you if that needle stick is going to hurt and you tell them no, then that's probably not true because it's a needle and it's going to go in them and it's probably going to hurt for a second. So a safer bet uh, that would keep you from lying to a patient and giving them false information would be to say, you're going to feel a poke and it may hurt for a couple of seconds, but I'll be quick and I'll try to do my best not to make it as painful as I can. Um, so after you uh, have the specimen collected, you want to make sure that you explain any guidelines or um, in the case of venipuncture, any site care. Uh, one of the things that I tell patients after I draw their blood every time is not to lift anything heavy or not to pick up your purse. Uh, a lot of patients are told to to bend their elbow with the cotton ball in their arm after uh, blood's drawn. I never tell patients to do that. I always tell them just to hold pressure down on their uh, venipuncture site for about five minutes and then not carry anything heavy for about half an hour. Uh, bending their arm just sends the blood outside of the hole, out the side of the hole. It doesn't really clog the hole. So um, you need to explain things like that to your patient to help keep them from getting hematomas or bruises or, you know, anything like that. Um, if it's not a venipuncture site, if it's anything else, uh, you want to make sure that you explain any restrictions or any follow-up care to help them prevent infections or, you know, stuff like that. Also, if they were on any dietary restrictions, then that if those continue, explain that to them. If those are lifted, you can let them know those types of things as well. And then lastly, uh, communicating with patients about results. So lab results and x-ray results, radiology results, any type of results, they are only going to go to the physician. They are not going to go to the patient. They have to actually be released to the patient. So only the doctor is allowed to interpret the results for the patient. That's not our job. However, the MA can communicate them to the patient with the doctor's permission once the doctor has reviewed them. So if the doctor looks, gets the results and whoever ordered them gets the results, looks them over and was like, oh, these are okay, you can go ahead and call the patient and let them know that all of her labs, you know, or his labs are okay, then uh, you can do that. But you cannot do that until the doctor has interpreted the results and checked them off and cleared them uh, as normal or as not needing follow-up or whatever the case may be. And then our last section is record keeping. So there are four points here in record keeping. So we start with lab requisitions. And um, I will show you a lab requisition in class. Actually, I think there might be one in your Chapter 45 Learning Objectives page for you to complete. Um, but if not, I will post one there for you. Lab requisitions are the, basically, they're, they're also known as lab orders. It's what we have to fill out or what needs to be filled out in order for a patient to get any type of um, lab testing or radiology or anything like that done. And so they have to be entirely filled out or we cannot collect the specimen and or the specimen will be rejected by the lab without all of the needed info. And so it has to have all the patient demographics on it, the doctor has to sign it, it has to have an ICD code on it. Um, in this case, we're still under ICD-10, so it has to have an ICD-10 code on it and um, it has to have insurance information. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, sorry, I had to pause you because my dog was, you know, having a moment. And uh, that happens sometimes when I record videos at home. Actually, most of the time when I record videos at home, so sorry about that. Okay, so back to the lab recs. Uh, when one of the, th the things that the lab recs have to have, they have to be signed by the doctor, they have to have a diagnosis code, um, and then one of the other things that we do is something called rec checking, and that is where we check for duplicate labs that have been ordered individually that may also be in panels, or if duplicate labs have 
been ordered in separate panels. So for example, a basic metabolic panel is included in a comprehensive metabolic panel. So if you have somebody who uh, shows up with a lab rec and they have both a BMP and a CMP ordered, as well as a glucose, essentially what is on that lab rec as it stands is three glucose tests because there is a glucose in the individual tests that was ordered and a basic metabolic panel and the comprehensive metabolic panel. So since we cannot bill uh, for three glucose tests, nor would you need to run three glucose tests on that one patient sample, you would rec check and cancel out the individual glucose test and the basic metabolic panel and only run the comprehensive metabolic panel because that includes everything from the other two tests ordered, the, the individual glucose test and the basic. So uh, rec checking is a big deal in lab world because it uh, helps eliminate the rejection of lab tests by uh, insurance on insurance claims. And so that's how the lab gets paid for doing the lab tests by the insurance company. And so it's kind of a big deal too. All right, and then lastly, uh, with lab requisitions, if a uh, the lab requisition will always go with the specimen to the lab. It's folded up, it's put in uh, the bag with the lab specimen to go. If it is missing, then the specimen will more than likely be rejected, or you have to track down the lab order, uh, the lab requisition, and that's a mess. People get angry about that. So make sure your uh, lab recs are always with the specimens, so that way it doesn't delay testing uh, or cause your specimen to be rejected. So identifying your specimens, it's super important that you make sure that you are labeling all of your specimens immediately. I mean like immediately. As soon as you're done drawing blood, as soon as the patient brings a urine cup back to you, as soon as whatever it is, um, you want to make sure that all specimens are immediately labeled with the patient's name, their ID code, most of the time that's their date of birth. Uh, the date and time of collection, the initials of the collector, the ordering physician, and any other info that's required by your facility. So a couple of pointers here. If it's a urine cup, it's a good idea to do that before they go pee in it because you probably don't want to touch it and label it after there's urine in it. It makes it kind of messy. Also, odds are, if they are human, they have probably peed on the side of the cup. Even men sometimes have trouble peeing in the cup directly, and if you're a girl, and you're trying to get a clean catch midstream where you have to pee in the toilet, pee in the cup, pee in the toilet again, it's a hot mess trying to get that all into the cup, that one little section of your, your stream into the cup. So even though the cups come back out and they're dry most of the time because patients are kind enough to take paper towels and blot the urine off the side of the cup, there is almost definitely pee on the side of that cup. Um, the exception to labeling beforehand are phlebotomy tubes. So you don't want to label your blood tubes until after they have been drawn from the patient. And the reason for this is sometimes the tubes blow and that means that uh, you'll put them on and the, they lose the vacuum or you'll have to do the draw a couple of times if it's a hard stick or for whatever reason. And so you don't want to label the tubes and not be able to use them. And so it's always a good idea to label the blood tubes in front of the patient directly after you have drawn the blood. Now, a lot of facilities have label machines, and so they will be labeled with a lot of this, the patient information, including the ordering physician um, and um, the, date and the date of collection and the patient's um, ID and their date of birth and all of that business. So um, that's good news, but you will still need to put on the label, I'm trying to make this bigger, you will still need to put on the label your, oop, I made it smaller, your uh, name and or your initials and the time of collection as well. For inventory control, I don't know, it's not going bigger now, I don't know what I did to it, I had to pause it because my dog started barking again because he's a little psychopath. Um, anytime anybody comes near our house, even the people who live in it come here, like he lets everybody know. 
Uh, so, sorry about that, I'm so sorry. Um, so the last two sections are inventory control, uh, equipment and supplies in the physician's office lab are routinely managed and they are systematically ordered. So you want to make sure that you are always mindful of supply overhead and helping with cost savings. For example, uh, in the lab world, especially for blood draws, butterfly needles are one example that comes to mind. They are about a dollar a piece, but regular vacutainer needles are about 33 cents each. So if you're doing, you know, 40, 50 blood draws a day and you're using butterfly needles, that's a quite a bit of a cost difference uh, per patient. And so um, a lot of students love to use the butterflies because you see the flash automatically so you know if you hit the vein or not and the vacutainer needles you don't know if you hit the vein until you put the tube on and so when i teach phlebotomy i teach with vacutainer needles first and then butterfly needles last for this reason alone uh, so that you don't get uh, be, so that students don't become dependent on the flash with the butterfly and the reason for that is because butterfly needles are so expensive I once worked at a lab where we had to log our butterfly usage because they are so much more expensive than regular uh, drawing needles and um, if we used over a certain number of butterflies in one week, we got wrote up for it because it was a cost saving measure. We had to sign on. They hired us to be phlebotomists, which meant that we knew how to draw blood with regular needles, not just relying on the fact that we needed a flash uh, and, a, and a butterfly tubing. So um, that's one, one thing that you should be mindful of if you do go to work in a lab is that you should uh, always kind of watch out for cost saving measures and make sure you're doing your part to maintain um, those things. The very last point on our map here is patient records. Um, and so results that have abnormals on them are always highlighted or circled and then brought to the physician's attention. And physicians will generally initial or make notes that they have reviewed those abnormal findings. Now, if uh, the patient records are loaded into an EHR, which most these days are, any um, EHR will most of the time automatically identify an abnormal lab when they're entered and that's what this little tiny line down here says that we can't see now because my thing won't blow up any larger and I'm sorry about that. Um, so that's nice and then it will send a prompt or you may have to initiate a prompt to the physician to um, review and initial those uh, abnormal values in the EHR instead of on paper. So that's it. So if you have any questions over chapter 45, you can hit me in class uh, next week. Otherwise, you can email me and let me know. And uh, I think that's it. I will put this map up into Canvas for uh, you to kind of base your map off of. And like I said, you cannot use this one on your test, but you can make your own or similar, uh, kind of like this. All right, I'll see you guys soon.